Well, I'm not preaching from the lectionary uh, this morning. Uh, as I mentioned last week, we we're receiving communion. I want to preach this sermon. I think we all talk about communion at, from time to time, refresh our memory on what it is that we're doing when we share the, the wine and the bread. So get your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I, it's a long reading, and I'm, I'm sorry I know it's boring that you just sit here and listen to somebody read, but you need to hear these words, and I need to, preach, I need to read them to you before I can preach them. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the, the Lord's supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink... Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped the verse. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you think of it. Whenever you drink, drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when you are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who's hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give you further instructions. And now, O oh Lord, we ask you to give us grace, some of that amazing grace that will help us understand these words that Paul has given, that you've given to us through Paul. So give us understanding, Lord, that we'll hear, know, and Take into our hearts the word that you speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we can fully understand what Paul uh, is talking about, I, we need a little bit of historical background uh, to understand this passage. The practices of Holy Communion or the Eucharist were very different then than they are now. The Lord's Supper was celebrated in the setting of a shared meal reminiscent of the Passover Seder. Does everybody know what a Passover Seder is? Anybody know? When you celebrate, when Jews celebrate Passover every year, it's one of their biggest festivals. And there's a ritual, there's a dinner they eat, and they have certain prepared foods, and blessings and grace and scriptures are read throughout the course of the meal. It's a, it's, a, it's a two or three hour deal. It's a wonderful thing. Maybe we should uh, do that sometime. Uh, but, uh, but eventually, and maybe because of problems like we see at Corinth, 
we separated the meal from the sacrament. So now we have fellowship and suppers down here and we set, do the sacrament up here so they don't get mixed up. And, uh, and maybe this problem is why that happened. I'm not sure exactly why. But uh, the warning not to eat and drink the sacrament in an unworthy manner is not introducing a new, a new subject. It was a reference to the, div the divisiveness, selfishness, even drunkenness that had crept into the observance uh, of, of the Lord's Supper. Now, and I, I know that people, I've had people say they didn't take communion because of this passage. They were afraid of taking it unworthy and they weren't sure what that means. And I hope we can resolve some of those issues for you. The problem, <clears throat> which is set out for us in 18, it says in the first place, I hear that when you come together at church, there are divisions among you. They, they were bickering about stuff. Um, and maybe stuff in the church, you know, where to put the piano, uh, that kind of thing, whether we can have pews or chairs. You know, you know churches split over that kind of stuff. They really do. Uh, so there were differences. And it cannot be questions that love and reconciliation are central to the gospel. <clears throat> Matter of fact, that's what the gospel is. is God trying to reconcile the world uh, to himself. And so they're just, uh, there's no room for bickering and division of this kind in the body of Christ. Listen to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 uh, 29. Uh, here Paul writing to the church at Galatia says, Before the coming of this faith, we were held in... Co no, wait, I'm sorry, I'm wrong verse. Verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. All of you. Through faith. Not by birth. Not by race or anything else. But by faith, you are children of God. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew or Gentile. That was one of the big divisions in Paul's time. They get into a supper and the Jews go to one side and the Gentiles to the other. They wouldn't fellowship with each other. And uh, that was, that's a problem. There is neither slave nor free. Nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And let me add that. I think Paul would allow me to add. Neither is there rich or poor. We're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It's not stated explicitly. But we, as I said, we could add rich or poor there. Paul makes it very clear that in Christ, one of the purposes of God in Christ was to destroy the divisions that exist between humans and in the hostility caused by them. We certainly understand that in these days, don't we? There's hostility in our nation, uh, in the world. It, 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 we can't even absolutely know for sure our kids are going to be safe at school. I mean, we, we need some help, don't we? Amen. Certainly the, the Lord's Supper is also not an arena to recreate these de destruction that God has made of these divisions between people. Now the result is in verse 20 and, and, and 21. And you, you heard the words, when you come together, some eat, others go hungry, one person gets drunk and they're, they're eating separately and ignoring one another. Now the result is there's no unity in their celebration. The poor are allowed to go hunky. There's drunkenness and greediness to satisfy the physical appetites. And Paul says this is not about filling your stomach. That's not what this supper is about. This is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. Paul is making it clear 
that this is not a function that we, we should focus upon or indulge our physical appetites. Rather, this is a time to celebrate the grace of God that's been given us in Jesus Christ. That amazing grace we just sang about. It's here, we're here to partake of spiritual food, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, represented by the bread and the wine. We are to fellowship with one another in the celebration of a new covenant, which is symbolized by the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and sealed by the Holy Spirit, who empowers us to love and forgive each other and to live in harmony and peace in spite of our differences. I'm so distressed in our time now that the way things are in our world, that, that we, we can't even sit down with somebody we disagree with. We don't want to be in the same room with them. It's just bad, really bad. And it's, it's happening in the church. We're getting political in the church. So the admonition to not take the sacrament in an unworthy manner does not mean that our lives have to be perfect. That, that, it, that if we can think of any way in which we've fallen short, then we've not measured up and we must not participate in Holy Communion. That's not the idea at all. In fact, the Lord's Supper is a continuing reminder that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that in Christ, there is continuing forgiveness and cleansing as we struggle to overcome the power of sin that grips our lives in some way and gives strength to the weak and to the weary. The unworthy manner has to do with not recognizing the body of the Lord, not acknowledging it. Now, that could mean two things. probably means both. It can mean Jesus' physical body. Uh, you know, some were treating the Lord's Supper as any other meal. Now, in sense to what it symbolized, and that was Jesus sacrificing his life, his physical body for our sins. And the proclamation is supposed, I mean, the Lord's Supper is supposed to be a proclamation to the world of his death. It says we proclaim his death until he comes. So we should come to the Lord's table with sensitivity to and reverence for the sacrifice which it represents. And in that sense, it is a solemn occasion that merits our examining ourselves. The Corinthians seem to have had the idea that nothing was amiss. But Paul corrected that misconception. By judging self, Paul means rightly distinguishing, distinguishing between what we are and what we ought to be. You know, what we ought to be is what God has called us to be. So that would be not recognizing Jesus' physical body, his sacrifice for all of us, that we could become one in him. Now the second way we could take that statement, not recognizing the body, is not, uh, uh, could refer to the church, because church is the body of Christ, right? We are the incarnation of God in the world today. Now, Paul has rebuked them for their general disregard for one another. The sacrament is not an individual thing. That's why I don't like doing the little cups. Well, we're forced to do that now because of circumstances. But, 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 the, but the communion is a, is a matter of community. It's something that the church does as a body. It's a corporate act of the church where we recognize and proclaim the presence of Jesus among us. Now, Jesus commanded us to love and to serve one another uh, as the means whereby we declare to the world our love for God, show the world that we're truly his disciples. Now, we do this not because we're alike 
or agree on everything. But because we share a common sinfulness and a common salvation through the holy body of Jesus and his blood shed on the cross. Now, in verse 29 and 30, he said, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Paul is reminding them in us of what the Bible has always taught. And I think now, which medical science is beginning to understand. Do you know, when I, when I, uh, when I started as a preacher, there was no chapel room in hospitals unless they were owned by a church. Like we had one at St. Mary's, but we didn't have one at Athens Regional. And now just about every hospital you go to, they have a chaplain and they have a chapel because they have recognized the undeniable fact that people who are prayed for do better. <laughs> they just do. And, uh, but it, it, it's reminded us uh, that we need to recognize that sin has physical consequences as well as spiritual. Sin is an opening for demonic invasion. Amen. Sin can cause wounds through which the, uh, the, the, the demons of hell can gain access to our life. Now the fact that we start the Lord's Supper with a prayer of repentance uh, tells us that it starts as a solemn event in which we should examine ourselves. And we ask God to examine us in some prayer. God, search me and know my heart. See if there are any anxious thoughts in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Uh, we repent of those things that God may reveal to us in that moment that are displeasing to him. Or it may be something he's been working on for a while and you've been working on. And you hadn't totally gotten control of it or gotten free from it. Well, we just humbly repent of those things that are displeasing to him and ask him to heal us and strengthen us to overcome. Surely, we must feel remorse from knowing that our sin made the agonizing death of Jesus necessary. We killed Jesus just like we'd been there nailing those nails in the cross. But at some point in communion, in, in the Eucharist, solemnity should turn to deep abiding joy as we recognize his presence with us, that our sins are forgiven, not in part, but the whole, not just some, but all the sins are forgiven, that we have an eternal destiny prepared for us, that he has given us of his spirit that we might love each other as members of one another in the body of Christ. That we may live holy lives worthy of his grace. That we might declare his praises to all the world. Now different people in different stages of life, uh, in, having different experiences in life, uh, may receive the Lord's Supper in different ways. It may mean something different. Some may prefer to be quiet and introspective, while others feel like shouting hallelujah. Uh, the imperative is this. As a group, we must show reverence for the occasion and respect for one another. Now, what I'm about to say now concerns how we normally share communion. Uh, we haven't done it this way for several years now because of the pandemic. I'm, I'm hoping we'll return to it. But we come to this altar in tables. The altar fills up, and I have someone assisting me, and we pass the bread and the cup around. And you share communion here, and then you go to your, that, that group goes to a seat, and then somebody else comes. You, you know the process. Uh, well, we can't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, but, but I want to say it for when we do get to it, and even uh, when we do it the way that we are, this is not a time 
uh, for us to make lunch plans with our neighbor <laughs> uh, where we're going to go to eat at church. Unnecessary conversation and physical activity may be a distraction to someone who is dealing with serious life issues. You know, somebody can walk in here and be on their last leg today. They may need to hear from God today. And if they don't, something drastic, you know, might happen. And we need to respect that. Uh, this used to weigh high on my ADHD that I've never been diagnosed with, but many people are confirmed I suffered with it. <laughs> because I'm sitting there watching these people go to communion table after table after table. I said, oh, Lord, this is ever going to be over. I'm ready to get out of here. There's got to be a quicker way to do this. And then I was I, confessing that to Beverly one day, and she said, well, you know what I do? And I just think it's great to sit there because most of those people, I don't think of all of them during the week. They're not close friends. They're just people I go to church with and I know them. But as they each one goes to communion, I pray for each one of them. And I said, wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes the time go by. And you don't feel like you're doing, you're doing something useful. Matter of fact, you're doing the most important thing that Christians ought to be doing, that's praying. And uh, practice in this way, you see, the Lord's Supper can be a meaningful and a fruitful experience for us all. I never want anybody to be afraid because of this passage to come to the Lord's table or to receive Holy Communion. Because if you will pray, if you will honestly pray the prayer of confession that we pray before the Eucharist, you can't, you can't take it unworthily. You, you, you're right with God then. You can come as long as you don't have hidden secrets in your heart away from God and are doing things in secret. So if we could get our prayer of confession, please. Does everyone have a communion set with you? A little cup with juice. Anybody don't have it, raise your hand and an usher will bring one to you. Anyone? You need one right here. Rest. Let's pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. You recall on how on the night that Jesus was arrested, he shared the Passover meal with his disciples. He was killed on the Passover. He is the Lamb of God, the, the, the slain Lamb that is slain on Passover. And he was doing the ritual of that meal with his disciples. And toward the end, he is to break bread and, uh, and give it to those who are there. This time he did something a little different that wasn't in the, the Hebrew ritual. As he broke the bread, he said these words, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of Jesus, who gave his life for us. You want to take a moment now to open up your juice. After the supper was over, there was a particular closing ceremony where he shared a common cup and he took the cup and he did something that wasn't in the ritual again. 
after he had blessed the wine, he said, this is my blood. It's poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we drink this cup in remembrance of you, that you gave your life on Calvary and shed your blood so that our sins could be forgiven.